All right, it seems we're doing a better job of keeping these short and snappy, but I suppose that's what happens if you don't put three minutes of advanced passenger train footage at the start of your video. Hello again everyone and welcome to the next lesson in the Permanent Way series where I use city skylines to explain railway concepts, uh, hopefully in a way that's easy to visualise. This time we're going to be talking about bridges and tunnels and actually not just bridges and tunnels but embankments, cuttings, underbridges, overbridges, intersection bridges, level crossings, very briefly. Basically all of the structures you need when your railway intersects a thing that won't get out of the way. Firstly, I'm sure you all understand, it's very rare for a railway to not come into contact with something that requires some form of structure to get past or through. That might well be an earthwork structure, like an embankment or a cutting. You can see here, I'm uh, just creating a nice vertical alignment for this straight bit of track, and by doing so, I'm creating both embankments, where the railway is above the general level of the ground, and cuttings, where the railway is below the general level of the ground. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is where you have another form of linear infrastructure, uh, in particular highways, so roads, and how you get through those on a railway that's at the same level as the road. Well, you use a level crossing. These are bad. As much as possible, we try and avoid installing these on new railways. In fact, we do not install them on new railways. And we spend a lot of time trying our very best to work out how to get rid of all the level crossings we have currently on our railway. Level crossings are bad because you're introducing a system that is very uncontrolled, i.e. roads, to a system that is very well controlled, but that has vehicles that can't stop very quickly. It's a really bad mix, particularly when people, uh, be them pedestrians or drivers, decide that they can uh, compete with a 300 ton train travelling at 70 miles an hour. I might well do another episode on level crossings, but for now we're going to move on to bridges. There are three broad categories of bridge that railways make use of. The first is the underbridge, that's where something goes under the railway. The second is the overbridge, that's where something goes over the railway. And the third is the intersection bridge, that's where a railway goes over or under another railway. In the UK at least, a viaduct is an underbridge with five or more spans, so that's connections between piers, and the piers are the kind of the vertical things that hold your bridge up. A tunnel is an overbridge that covers the railway for a length of 50 metres or more. So a viaduct, five spans, tunnel, 50 metres or more. An important thing we have to think about with our railway alignments is the curvature through bridges. Ideally, you'd always have a straight track alignment through bridges, and certainly for new build railways, that's what you aim for. Sometimes, though, you need to have some form of curvature. In this instance, you would try and keep your curves as flat as possible. You'd also try your hardest to keep curvature constant through the bridge. So if you're going to have a curve on a bridge, don't have a straight and a curve. You're going to have a single constant radius through that bridge. It's a different story on the approaches to railway bridges, particularly where the railway is crossing a body of water. It's not uncommon to find the railway utilising very tight horizontal curvature on the approaches to bridges, and that's related to a bridge's skew angle. What I mean by that is the angle that the railway makes with whatever it is crossing. So for a river, if you draw a line kind of along the centre of the river and then you draw your railway over the top, it's the angle between the two. Ideally, you want your skew angle to be 90 degrees. So you want to cross whatever it is you're going over pretty much at a right angle. That's not always possible though. And you can tighten that skew angle up to an extent, remembering that the tighter the skew angle, generally the longer your span will be. And the longer the span, the more expensive your bridge has to be, the more elaborate the structural form has to be. When it comes to road crossings, if you've got a very high skew angle, the chances are you need to build a long box structure rather than a single span bridge, and those are very expensive. For rivers, high skew angles are just not possible. Another factor to consider is the clearance above or below your railway crossing. So you need to think about what rolling stock are you running along your railway through that bridge. So whether it's freight or passenger stock, that all changes how much height you need above the railway. You also need to think about electrification as well. Do you need to provide extra clearance for electrification? In terms of clearances underneath the railway, that might be for HGVs, for other railways, or if you're going over water, that might well be clearance for ships, or indeed for the flood level that the water might rise to. When it comes to understanding clearances above the track, that's getting into the realms of what we call gauge clearance analysis, or gauging, and that's something that very much keeps permanent way design engineers busy. I think I'll probably do a lesson all of its own on gauging, because there's quite a lot to talk about. Let's come back to tunnels, because we haven't really talked about them in any great detail yet. Tunnels conform to all the same rules as we've discussed already relating to curvature and related to clearances and indeed related to skew angle. You know, the shallower an angle you intersect the thing that you want to go underneath, the longer your tunnel will be, the more expensive it will be. 
Just like with underbridges and viaducts where you have an approach embankment so the railway rises up above the general ground level, with tunnels there is invariably a cutting on the approach to the tunnel. So as the railway dips below the general ground level, you'll have a deeper and deeper cutting until you need to build a tunnel. In city skylines, just as in the real world, you're not going to build little short skips of tunnel because building, inspecting and maintaining tunnels is expensive. It's more than likely that you would build either a deep cutting and then bridge over the top, or in the real world, this isn't something you can replicate in city skylines, you use cut and cover methods rather than boring and excavation. So that's where actually you basically create a cutting, put your railway in it and then bury the railway again. The last two things I'm going to talk about are differential stiffness and differential settlement. These are two, they're almost two sides of the same coin really, but they're related to the way that you hold the railway up and the transitions between different types of structure that hold the railway up, different stiffnesses of structure that hold the railway up. So they might be the difference between two types of track fixing, it might be the difference between an earthwork and a bridge, it might be the difference between two different types of bridge structure, say between moving between like a concrete arch and a steel, uh, a steel span. It might even be the differences in geology along a single earthwork. In any case, differential stiffness and differential settlement are two things that we have to understand and manage very carefully as permanent way engineers and civil and structural engineers. For example, a soft spot in the track bed will degrade over time, resulting in a dip in the track and damage to track materials. Conversely, at hard spots in the track, such as at underbridges or culverts, the surrounding earthworks will settle over time, resulting in a hump in the track again with the potential to damage track materials and give a rough ride. In all cases, at the lesser end of the spectrum, you're talking about reductions in track quality, so you know, not as nice a ride for passengers. At the extreme end, you're talking about damage to track materials, and in fact, worse than that, potential to derail trains. When it comes to the interaction of track on a bridge and off a bridge, we call that track bridge interaction. Differential stiffness and settlement and track bridge interaction are not things you need to worry about in city skylines, but they are things that keep real engineers up at night. These are also influenced by things like whether we use fixed or ballasted track forms, what sort of fastenings we're using, the method of construction of your bridge or earthwork, how quickly you're planning to build the bridge, all the sorts of things that permanent way, civil, structural, formation, geotechnical engineers have to think about whenever we're mucking around with railway structures, either building them as new or indeed replacing or repairing them. So, what have we covered? Embankments and cuttings, level crossings, we've talked about underbridges, overbridges, intersection bridges, viaducts, tunnels. Uh, we've talked about curvature, both through a structure and on the approaches to structures. We've talked about skew angle, we've talked about clearances and gauging. And we've talked about differential stiffness, differential settlement and track bridge interaction. Hopefully that's a nice little summary of railway structures and some of the things you have to think about, some of the things that you might want to think about when you're creating your city skylines layouts. Join us next week for the next lesson where I think we're going to be talking about basic junctions, so switches and crossings, the parts of the railway where multiple tracks converge and diverge. I'll see you then. Cheerio!